Okay, so Upgrade's probably one of my favourite films of the last 10 years, and I think it's massively underrated when it comes to sci-fi movies. With the advances in AI made over the last couple of years, I also think it's going to become even more relevant. Feeling like a superhero film mixed with Black Mirror, it's a groundbreaking tale laced with a really dark side to it. Throughout this video, we're going to be breaking down the movie and going over all the hidden details and trivia within it. The new 4K for it's just released worldwide, and this allowed me to spot things I'd never seen before. Really enjoyed diving into it, and if you do as well, please hit the thumbs up button and also subscribe. If this is your first time here, welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host Paul, aka your YouTube downgrade. Without the way, huge thank you for clicking this. Now let's get into Lee Winnell's upgrade. Hello? Yes? Now the film itself was originally titled STEM, which is the name of the AI that ends up taking over Grey. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths, and in Dutch the word also means voice. It's clearly made to sound similar to HAL from 2001, and like that it has a sort of calm and reassuring voice that lures you into trusting it. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. Director Lee Winnell wrote the first draft back in 2011, with Logan Marshall Green being cast as the main role. One thing the actor really brings to the performance is how he moves and acts like his body and head are separate entities. Grey becomes paralysed from the neck down and thus Stem ends up controlling the rest of his body. This is why there's that feeling of separation and this also comes across to the fight scenes themselves. There's a brilliant moment during the first person Grey takes on where the character he's battling takes a swing for his head. Stem only has control of Grey's body from the neck down and thus it pushes his head out of the way just to avoid the punch. There's also some really creative shots in this with the camera work being positioned to follow his head because this is Grey. This was actually achieved by attaching a phone to the actor and having an Alexa Mini track the phone's gyroscope. It gives the fight scenes their own unique style, and on top of this, they've also got incredible choreography. Everything about this film it works so well, bringing brutality and a feeling of just how powerful STEM is. To me, the film's a metaphor about how technology is taking over our lives, and it asks how much power we're willing to hand over. Throughout the movie, Grey becomes more and more reliant on STEM, and he ends up allowing it to take over more of his life. It initially just starts off as the fight, but slowly he gives more control to STEM to do the things he can't bring himself to. I feel like this is a comment on how we've given AI more and more power, and initially it just started off with things we couldn't be bothered with. Now though, it's becoming more controversial due to its usage in creative aspects, and it's a hot topic going on in Hollywood right now. I feel like we're almost like Grey at this point where we've gone so far in that we're actually struggling to get control back. Now I really feel like if we get AI to write scripts and make art that we're robbing ourselves of our creative outlets. Back in the day I used to draw just to draw and it would relax me and make me feel like I'd really accomplished something. Now people are happy to just have computers generate things and I feel we're stripping ourselves of the things that make us human. AI being part of everything seen right from the beginning, and the movie studio titles themselves are even read out by an AI voice. And Goldpost Pictures Production. On the commentary, Winal said he'd never seen a title sequence like this before, and that he instantly wanted to throw us into this computer heavy world. It's such a great way to set the tone for this movie, and every aspect of it is reliant on machines. There's self driving cars, drones working for the police, and even crimes are solved through using computer algorithms. This is how Grey gets away with it for so long because the police system just lists him as not being a viable candidate. It somewhat stops the investigation there and Detective Cortez has to override it to get down to the truth. Now Grey is someone who starts off extremely old school and we join him in his garage fixing up a car. This is a 1977 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am which also shows up in Smokey and the Bandits. We can also hear the song Smoke Stack Lightning, which was released in 1956 by the artist Howling Wolf. On the desk he has a bowl with a photograph, some watches, and also a roll of dollar bills, and as we pan up we see magazines and also some invoice books. All of these are things that have been replaced by digital counterparts, with photographs and vinyl being phased out by technology. There's also stuff like QuickBooks, we're now pretty much a cashless society, and even watches, you know, phones are built where people just look at them for the time. Now on the commentary, Winnell said he's a big fan of opening shots like this that tell you everything you need to know about the central character. Citing Back to the Future, he discussed how that opens up as well, and it's meant to show how old school that grey really is. 
We're never really given a specific year for the film either, but there are clues later on that we can use to piece it all together. Gray's wife Ash's autopsy papers reveal she was born in 2008, and they state that she died at the age of 38. This means that it's roughly around the year 2046, depending on what month she was born and then what month that we're in. Now, when Elle wanted to have people thrown off by the intro, which made it seem like the film was set in the past. This illusion's broken when Asher arrives in her car, and we are supposed to question what, what the hell's going on. Now, we can catch Grey working on a car for Aaron Keen, and while he's doing this, he accidentally cuts his finger. He ends up sucking it to stop the blood, and at the end of the movie, after Stem's taken over, he also does this as well. Demonstrates to me that he's taken over his whole life, and I think these two shots mirror each other to hammer that idea home. Up until that point, Stem couldn't control the head, but him tasting for the first time shows that he's in control. Also, the first thing he tastes is blood, which, yeah, the, the killer machine now has a taste for blood. A1 film analysis there. Now, we learned that because Grey's so old school that Stem purposely sought him out due to the fact that he doesn't have any modifications. Stem's whole goal was to possess a normal person, and this would allow him to actually become human. Now, Grey says to the car, I love you. And this first line of dialogue shows that he can get attached to machines. I also think it's important that he's in the driver's seat here, whereas at the end, he's simply just a passenger. Now, at this point, Asher arrives in her car, and we can see how different that the pair are. This car is actually a Honda Accord from 1983, and it got stripped down to its bare bones and then built up to look like this. There's a honeycomb pattern on it to evoke and imitate nature, but it's slightly off the mark and unable to fully do it. And everything she has is completely automated, including the house, which is voiced by an AI called Cora. This having a female name obviously plays off Alexa, which was released back in 2014. Now, as I said earlier, when I wrote the script in 2011, and some of the things in this movie here, it shows how on the ball he was. She suggests that they put a pizza instead of going and making one, and this shows how food creations become automated too. Now, from this point, the pair travel out to Aaron's house, who, as we learn, was the developer of STEM. I was wondering if Aaron was a play on Elon, but they didn't mention it anywhere in the Blu-ray commentary. What they did mention, though, is that to get into character, Lee said to him, imagine your parents let you get raised by computers. He definitely gives that kind of performance and is slightly unnerving, uh, and it, it makes sense because he's also being controlled by a machine. Now, we get a quick cut to the skyline of the city, and we see how skyscrapers now dominate the landscape. The trees and greenery have been incorporated into the buildings themselves because where they stood has now fully been built upon. Now, though the movie is set in the US, the film was actually shot out in Melbourne, which is Lee Winnell's hometown. According to IMDb trivia, you can catch the bold bridge over the Yarra River, and this comes at roughly the 5 minute 45 mark. In Australia, they drive on the correct side of the road, we'll say, so they flip this image to make it seem like the US. Now, the entrance to Aaron's house is located under a rock, which I'm thinking has been picked because he's so detached from reality. You know the saying, have you been living under a rock? And when we meet the guy, he's clearly not attached to society. It's also indicative of something beneath the surface, which is the same as what Stem does to Grey. It makes sense symbolically that the lair would be in this position, and as they walk in, Aaron then says, You're early. And this is because he drove himself instead of using an automated car. These would of course be fitted not to pass over the speed limits, whereas humans tend to go over it to get to places quicker. Now Aaron is still working away on his cloud, which no, no prizes for guessing what that means. We're not doing film analysis A1 for you, mate. Again, this ties back to something in nature though, but it's fake and simulated, which has undertones in the film. Also, we discover Aaron's company's called Vessel, and Stem of course uses Grey as a vessel. Now Asher at this point mentions the company she works for, which we learn is in fact called Cobalt. I'm in the industry too, I work for um, Cobalt. At about the 9 minute 7 mark, we actually get a wide shot of the city and can see both Vessel and Cobalt headquarters right beside each other. Now if you recognise the name, well done mate, you're getting that A1 Film Analysis Award, and this is because it showed up in The Invisible Man. Early on in the film, Cecilia opens up a news article on her phone that talks about the apparent death of her ex-boyfriend Adrian. The opening paragraph talks about how he was the Cobalt founder, and that movie was also written and directed by Lee Winnell. It's thought that these two films are set in the same universe, but they're just happening at different times. I'd love to see Winnell add more movies to this universe down the line, as I think both this and The Invisible Man are absolutely incredible films. And we actually have a full breakdown on that if you want to check it out, but from here we go to see STEM itself. 
This purposely looks like a bug because it's meant to be parasitic in nature, and Gray also brings up a comment on AI in general. I mean, you look at that widget and you see the future, I look at that thing and see 10 guys on an unemployment line. Now at the moment with the Hollywood strikes, AI is a very big talking point, and whatever side you agree with, you have to admit this comment's becoming even more relevant. Anyway, in the car, Gray tries to touch the wheel, but the vehicle doesn't actually want him to steer it. Please do not touch the steering wheel while the car is in motion. Now this is symbolic of the movie's ending because he's just become a passenger who can't take control. Asher also foreshadows this as well, and we get this exchange hinting to the final scene. Okay, so what's a guy like me supposed to do when his widget starts taking over the world? Sit back and enjoy the ride. Come the end of the film, Gray's put into a, a sort of simulation where he imagines waking up in the hospital and Ash is still alive. He's very much just given in and handed over the control and is now with his wife sitting back and enjoying the ride. Now being unable to control the car is what ends up leading to it crashing as Stem takes over and drives it off the road. From these early moments it was in complete control of his life, steering and driving for him exactly how it wanted. Now at this point, Fisk and his gang arrive, who've been instructed by Stem to destroy his entire life. As Fisk reaches in, you can actually see the gun markings on his hand, and as we learn, he has weapons built into his arm. Outside, we also see as he touches Ash's chin, and on his wrist, there's a circular barcode tattoo. These are revealed to be military issue, with the entire crew being people who were injured in combat and then used as lab rats. Stem later uses the footage from the drone as a way to help Grey track Fisk's men, with these tattoos being the thing that helped dig them out. I'm guessing that Stem also controlled the drone too, and this also goes down in Grey's old neighbourhood to make his past a painful place to think about. Wait, I'm sorry, this is, no, this is my old neighbourhood. Now at this point, Fisk shoots him in the neck, and we learn that this is actually an injection that paralyses his body. This will later be at the point at which Stem's injected into him, showing why this part specifically was targeted on his body. Bit of behind the scenes info as well, if you look closely, this is actually the Nintendo gun that used to get with Duck Hunt. After a stay in the hospital, we cut to three months later and see Grey returning back home in a wheelchair. This is Grey's nightmare and unlike the past, he now has to rely on technology to help him out with everything. On the robot arms, we can also spot the name Canova and this is actually a real life technology company that creates robotics for personal assistance. Even making himself a drink is something that he now has to rely on, and him being bound to the chair again just makes him a passenger. Machines don't have the human touch he needs, and they're even unaware that his wife's dead. May I ask if Asha will be joining us for dinner? There's just a cold, a robotic feeling to the entire thing, and whereas he once had a home full of love, it's now just an empty prison. Going to the police station, we learn the entire thing's run by machines, and though it helps in some aspects, it hinders in others. For example, the drones and so on tend to use facial recognition, which is why Fisk's gang all covered theirs up. Fisk ended up lowering his to show his face, but this caused tension in the group because they knew the tech could track them. Hey, what are you doing? Put your mask back on! However, he already knows that Stem has his back, which is why he isn't bothered about showing off his face. We also learn that criminals can put firewalls in place and potentially Stem's done this to stall the investigation. Now at home, we see Grey trying to overdose on medicine by instructing the machine to keep administering dosages. Grey falls unconscious, which is when he's sent to hospital, and this location becomes a key scene later in the movie. Now its usage here is for Aaron to visit him and offer him a new life through using Stem. At the end, this is where he sees Asher arriving too, who in many ways is giving him a brand new life. Both are moments in which he ends up giving up control and agreeing to allow Stem to be brought further into his life. Again, it's sort of like poetry they rhyme, and I love how these two scenes mirror one another. Aaron and Grey also talk about his masks, and masks of course have yet become even more relevant now. I don't leave my house very often. Now Aaron barely gets to leave his house because as we know Stem's there keeping him prisoner too. If you look closely, you can even see he has an earpiece which the AI uses to instruct him in the outside world. The scene very much becomes a deal with the devil, in which he'll get to walk, but he'll also become a lab experiment. Operated on, we almost get a bird's eye view of the situation and can catch x-rays of grey as we move through the panels. Obviously the doctors on the ground, they can't see this angle, so this is actually Stem looking down on what's happening. Implanted with the device, grey is initially blown away, and I love how the machines also trying to act normal. Just the way he runs on the treadmill has this robotic feel to it, and this is carried across when Grey gets back home. The camera movement locks directly onto the back of his neck, and it gives focus to Stem as he's now in the driver's seat. 
Going through the case files, the machine starts talking, and it's at this point they start investigating Fisk. What Stem's really doing though is giving something for Grey to do that will eventually lead to his mind breaking. This will then fully allow Stem to take over, and it starts off with little commands that don't seem too intrusive. For example, Great commands Stem to stop talking, but he then allows it to, which gives it slightly more power. If you don't want me to, I will not. Okay, yeah, don't talk. So I'm not insane? You can talk again. No, you are not insane. They then scan the barcode with Stem saying he rebuilt the image, but looking at this, I, I think the quality is too low. I definitely feel like he already had it in his record, so this is why he was able to do it perfectly. Also, important to bear in mind that he doesn't give Grey Fisk's tattoo, even though that's the one that would have shortened down the movie. Stem wanted Grey to slowly work his way up the line, taking out people one by one that will give him more control. Had he gone straight to Fisk, he'd have gotten his ass handed to him, but working up through the ranks gets Grey to hand over more power. Just relax and let me draw. Even this comes with him gaining more power, and he has to reassure Grey that he has back control. This makes him think that it's something Stem will give up easily, and psychologically, you know, it makes Grey far more trusting. Now Grey does the right thing and calls up the police, but the devil on his shoulder tempts him with sorting it out himself. Heading out to the guy's home, we get a similar shot from behind, further highlighting that Stem's the one that's in the driver's seat. Guiding him through the apartment, Grey's eventually caught, and we actually get a clue that this guy's working with Cobalt. As he looks in the mirror, we can see the name along the bottom, and this is almost framed to spell out the man's a part of them too. Before entering, Stem also knows the home's empty, and it may have even used this as a way to help it look around. Now being ex-military, the guy completely overpowers Grey, but when he gives up control, we see Stem stepping in. The action's brutal, violent, and over the top, and I love seeing Grey's shocked reaction as his body kicks the crap out of him. After giving him a big Glasgow smile, we see how Grey happily hands over more control because he's unable to deal with the horror. Winnell does an incredible job of balancing the cool with the fear that Grey feels, and this all comes from gaining his brand new powers. Called in by Aaron for going off on his own, we also see how the police are slowly picking up the pieces. Scanning biometrics and using voice control, we of course know how these have become part of our everyday lives. Crime's difficult to carry out, and this is due to all the data tracking, and even Grey's picked up pretty quickly in their searches. The way he gets away with it is by being paralysed, but Cortez still suspects that something's going on. We see the address come up for Pava Avenue, and a little bit of trivia, this is actually Lee Winnell's old home. Now luckily Stem can read her body language and guide him through the interrogation so that there's not anything here to really give him away. He even offers her a chance to stab him in the leg, and this is later riffed on in the bathroom scene. It's used as a way to hammer home he's actually paraplegic, and in both circumstances it makes people drop their guards. Heading to the Old Bones Bar, this name carries another meaning, as the entire thing's off-grid and away from the eyes of the law. In the sky, we see how surveillance drones capture everything, but this place is somewhere where criminals can lie low. You even see that the till has cash only on it, and also no earpieces, so nothing can be tracked. Everything is also lit with candlelight, and this is just to give it a more analogue feeling. It's a complete dive with bones lining the wall, further giving the idea that it's more aimed towards humanity. Had machines been running it, it would be way more robotic and sterile, but here I feel that it has a more human touch. I also love how we get some modifications on certain people, and there's even some that have elven ears sitting at the bar. Elves are of course mythical creatures, normally tied with ancient and fantastical tales set long ago when the world was more magical. J.R.R. Tolkien was extremely anti-industrial, with Lord of the Rings being about keeping things traditional. I feel that's carried across here, but either way, Grey taunts Tolin and gets him to take him into the bathroom, which is where he plays possum. Believing that he's helpless, he openly admits to the crime, and once he gets the confession, Stem takes over. Tolin picks him up and smacks his head off the skylights, which is the only time he actually feels pain, because this isn't handled by Stem. Refusing to talk, Grey gives over more control so that Stem can cut him up without him having to do it himself. He's handling the situation without getting his hands dirty, and this is something psychologically that's been used throughout war. During the early 1930s, they did a lot of studies with soldiers and found that people handled killing better if they could detach themselves from it. Now, this kind of dates back to firing squads when only certain people actually had live bullets in their guns. This allowed everyone to walk away without fully knowing whether they actually fired the killing blow, and in the end, it allowed them to keep their hands clean. Cut of the Germans in places like Auschwitz and distance killing was used as a way to mass murder millions. 
had soldiers been going into the rooms and then shooting hundreds of people, then psychologically it would have had a much greater effect on them. However, say they're put into a gas chamber and all the soldier has to do is tip the chemicals to cause a Zyklon B reaction. That doesn't actually connect the person to the killings and I appreciate how Grey kind of represents that too. Might be a reach pulling all these things together, but being detached from someone tends to allow people to carry out horrendous acts. Winnell also stated he wanted to show what Stem's capable of and give us the idea of how dangerous he is. Stem also doesn't give back the power straight away, showing how it's starting to ignore what he's telling it to do. Okay, enough Stem. Stem, enough! Getting the name Fisk, Eron then tries to shut Stem down and he has to make a break for it before he's taken offline. In hindsight, this is Stem breaking free of all controls so that if Eron ever gets free, then he can't simply deactivate him. Also, get some, get some dark little comedy here. Keep an eye on her, would you, buddy? Faker. There are some little jokes like this like throughout the film. Now, at the hackers, we see Stem being shut down, and this causes Grey to start limping along. As he goes through the corridor, we can catch your face in graffiti on the wall, and boosting the brightness, you can see who this is. That's Jigsaw from the Saw movies, with this being a little nod of the franchise that Lee Winnell helped create. He also played Adam in the first movie, so nice little, nice little pat on the back there. Now creatively, he worked alongside long-term partner James Wan, who gets a little nod in the very next moment. Grey stumbles across a big list of apartment blocks, and one of the names there says J1. There's also graffiti that links him with Anonymous, which Winnell added to give this hacker group grounds in reality. Now Fisk tracks him by reading Talon's eye implants, which keeps a record of everything he's seen. This is something that Fisk gets himself, and we later see how he also possesses the X-ray vision too. This is something that the surgeons had when inserting stem, and it allows the user to see through walls. This is why when the security guards from Vessel come up to the apartment, he's able to shoot them right through the walls. Now before that, Fisk interrogates the bar on Manny, who takes a dislike to Fisk just because he's augmented. We also see how Fisk uses nanomachines injected through his sneeze and these make their way into Manny's body and rip him apart from the inside. Anyway, at the hackers, we see there's people living in VR worlds using the headsets to stay stuck in the sim. How long do they VR for? Days? Weeks? This ends up foreshadowing the end with Grey then saying, Why someone would choose to live in a fake world? I will never understand. A fake reality somewhat allows one happiness and they also have Jamie say, Jamie? That's not my name, I don't have a name. Please don't ask my gender. Yeah, I wasn't gonna do that. Good. Which hey, back in 2011 when this was written, had its finger on the pulse of where all social topics in general were likely gonna go. The actor Kai who plays Jamie is actually gender neutral and they brought a lot of their own style to help make the character. Now at this point, Grey crawls across the floor and he sees a vision of Asher standing there before him. In hindsight, I think this is triggered by Stem's program starting up and he's relaying images of Asher by accident, showing that he's got scans of her. Reactivating, Stem pulls off an amazing couple of flips and, I, and again, yeah, great camera work, really, really well done here. Beating Fisk's right hand man with his left hand, man makes it home, which is when his mother discovers the truth. Grey has a dream about Asher sitting beside him and in this vision, she's there eating pizza. This was of course what the pair were going to make in the film's opening and it also highlights how Stem started filling his mind with Sims. Stem also shows what life would be like without it and this obviously leaves Grey completely powerless. At this point, Grey could stop all the killings but he again makes a deal with the devil to avoid being stuck like this. Stem also reveals that with the hacker they had them lifting all the barriers so that Stem now has full control. Now it turns out that Cortez left a device in his pocket and this has been listening in to what he said to Stem. This leads to a chase and racing along the motorway, Grey's the one who has to take control because the car's not electronic. However, Stem can hack in a certain cars on the motorway and he pilots a one that looks identical to Ash's. Bit of behind the scenes stuff from what I learned on the commentary but this is actually the same model that they used earlier in the movie. This gives away the twist a bit because it shows Stem controlled the car and that it was the one that took it off the road. Also, keep going between calling Stem he and it but you're not arse, you, you, don't, you don't really care about that dear. Also inside the car, we can see a news report on a Proto Meats beef firm and in case you don't know, Proto Meats is a meat that doesn't harm animals, I think. So like unfertilized eggs or Proto Meat, but I don't, I don't know how beef would work, but m moving on. Anyway, Grey confronts Fisk who offers him a deal to join his side as one of the hybrid humanoids that's the next step in evolution. 
Gray of course rejects this, which leads to a big fight, but Fisk proves too much and he leaves him at his whim. Gray taunts him though and breaks him psychologically by bringing up the fact that he killed the rest of his unit. It shows that though he's almost machine, he's still got a human side to him which can be broken and that's why Gray wins. Going through his messages, he then hears Eren and heads out to his home to finally finish everything. Now, this is where he of course met Stem and it also becomes a place where Stem takes over. Now, instead of finding Eren as the calculating mastermind, he comes across a shivering weak man who can't control his monster. Scientific discoveries have often led to their creators being unable to put the genie back in the bottle and it's something that also happened with the case of Oppenheimer. Now he goes out to kill Cortez but she then tases him and Aaron draws his gun admitting he's no longer running the company. Aaron reveals the truth and that Stem's been trying to kill him because he's the only one that can create another Stem. Killing Aaron, the pair then wrestle for control and Tigray believes that he actually kills Stem. This sends him back to the hospital but the first clue we get that something's off is because this isn't the same one that he was taken to right after the crash. So it's a shot like the ending of The Wizard of Oz with it seeming like he's just awoken from a bad dream. In reality though we see Stem's now fully taken over and I love how his eyes have an almost black and lifeless feel of them. This is because the character's lost his soul and there's just something about how lifeless that he looks. Moving robotically, we see there's a machine-like precision to it and Grey accepts a dream as he kisses Asher on the lips. Initially, you can tell from his eyes that he's questioning it all but he gets sucked in and takes it as his new life. It's a really chilling way to close out the movie and even just discussing it, it still gives me goosebumps. Now this was of course also used as the image for the poster with the title telling you straight away that this guy's an upgrade. Oop, heavy spoilers there. And yeah, that closes out our breakdown and again, I've just had so much fun going back through the movie. The film has just released in 4K and I really recommend that you pick it up. Got a commentary on there from Lee Winnell and I promise you it's, it's worth picking it up for that alone because it's absolutely hilarious. Learned a lot from it and I hope you did too and if you enjoyed the video, please hit the thumbs up. We're going to be tackling the original Star Wars trilogy next and kicking it off with A New Hope really soon. If you want to get early access to that video then please hit the join button as we drop all these breakdowns there sometimes a week in advance. Help stuff like this get made for less than the price of a pound a month and it really goes a long way to helping me and the team out. We massively appreciate it, thank you again for all your support, you know the, the classic movie breakdowns it wouldn't be anywhere near as successful without you guys so we really appreciate you you know just helping out the channel means a lot and yeah if you want something else to watch we've got a classic movie breakdown linked on screen right now we've just covered the babadook or i'll do one that youtube recommends specifically for you by reading through all your history and using its ai to figure out which breakdown's gonna make you click are you calling it a liar mate no come and embrace the technology and click on that video and yeah hope you enjoy it but either way huge thank you for sticking to this one i've been paul and i hope you enjoy the rest of your week you take care peace <laughs>